dream. You are falling, lost in the listening distance, as dark locks in. <laughs> Nightfall. Good evening. Tonight, we go on vacation with a writer to a small town on the East Coast. Forever. The play, a new play by Janet Bonelli, is called In the Name of the Father. Are you free? Excuse me, is your cab free? I, I want to go to Comfort Fen. Oh. Do you know the distance? It's a long way, you know. I'm free, all right, but it'll cost you. I know it's a long way. How much is your flat rate? Fifty. Or at least fifty. And I won't get a return fare, so it's double. Oh, come on. I have friends in Halifax. They said maybe sixty or seventy at the most. So let your friends drive you there. I'll say 85, and that's it. Well, I guess I don't have much choice, do I? Okay, 85. Give me a hand with my luggage, will you? It was a bad summer. It had started late, like it was too tired to get up and get hot and get on with it. But I needed a holiday. And my Halifax friends had recommended Comfort's End, a, a coastal community with lovely scenery, low prices, and decent people who minded their own business. Well, I didn't know that part of the province, but I desperately needed a few fresh air-filled weeks by the sea. And then I saw the rocks. You going to Comfort's End on business? Oh, no. No, it's a holiday. Oh, yeah? Well, not much to do there. Wouldn't be my choice of a holiday spot if I was a young lady. Well, my friends tell me it's quite beautiful. Isn't the town some sort of historical site? <laughs> oh, I never heard that one. A lot of superstition, but no real history, I don't think. No place for a holiday, as far as I'm concerned. Well, I'm a writer, and the place in past and drama is interesting. I'm sure I'll like it. Besides, I don't enjoy places where people depend on nightclubs and bars and things for their vacation. Oh, yeah? Where are you staying? Well, my friends, the, the people in Halifax, they booked a room for me with a family called Wicklow. Oh, do you know where their house is? Oh, yeah. I know it. It took us about an hour to get there. And all along the way, I saw the rocks. They were large, flat, shapeless, smooth and gray as a winter sky. And beyond the rocks was the ocean, deep and half asleep. Black glass disturbed only by the occasional curlew fishing for lunch. Or once, cut in parallel stripes by half a dozen bleak, unbending fins. Oh, look, look! What? Look at... shark... Oh, lots of swimming things out in these parts. Fish and everything in the water out here. And suddenly I didn't like it. Dark waves, a low, low sky, both splashing and drizzling on those flat gray rocks. I didn't like it. And something told me to turn back. I couldn't. I... And, and this was, of course, long before I knew anything about the people and their damnable, dreadful christening Sunday. Are these good friends that sent you out to the ends of the earth for your vacation? It's a funny sort of place to send anyone, I think. My friends speak very highly of the Wicklows. I, I gather the food at their place is very good. Oh, Nan Wicklow has a reputation for her cooking. Whatever else happens, you'll be fed, all right. As we approached the town, it appeared to be even prettier than I'd imagined. My apprehension faded for a while, caught up in the atmosphere... Oh, the houses were so old, they'd sunk beneath the street, so, so a person would have to step down to get into the entrance instead of stepping up. And, uh, and these signs dangled from wrought iron arms in strange shapes like uh, snail patterns. 
They said things like trap sold, fresh lobster, nets mended. And then, for people like me, souvenirs. Oh, thank you very much, miss. Uh, Plan to give me a guilt complex, did you? Well, that's very kind of you. Here's hoping the holiday's all it's cracked up to be. Oh, here's my card. Nan Wicklow can call me if you need transportation back. Well, here you are. We've been expecting you. We don't really get many visitors, although we're well equipped to handle them. Your friends, your Irishmen, seem to like my ears. You may well put on a few pounds if you have a taste for seafood. <laughs> it was everything Kate Ryerson had promised. That night we had tiny shrimp served with brown bread and sweet butter, smoked haddock and milk, scallops cracked at the edges in white wine sauce, blueberry muffins, and green beans that snapped in their dish. Late that night, I sat on the veranda watching the street. There, there were lights in the harbor. There was a murmur of voices. But I couldn't see anyone. Outside my window, the moonlight fell on the rocks. Slippery rocks bedded in bubbles and green pools of swimming things... I was the only guest in the house, but I knew there were other people. Nan Wicklow had a husband. Oh, and they both had a daughter. Her name was Callista. Good morning, Mr. Gifford. Hello, I'm Callista Wicklow. Mm. I'll assume you're sleeping well. People like that bedroom you're in. They like my mother's cooking, too. Although it's no time to go on a diet. <laughs> yeah, your mother's a sensational cook. And yes, yeah, I'm enjoying myself very much. So far. Yeah, well, of course, so far. We don't get many visitors. Certainly not at this time of year. Well, surely this is a good time. And, uh, late summer is good weather. It's an excellent time for scenery and good weather. That's why it's our time. We don't encourage strangers. <laughs> when... Not to make you feel unwelcome. We like people. And you're so pretty. You'll be well liked. I hope people like me. Although, I've been here almost a week and I've never seen anyone outside of your mom and dad and a few men down by the harbor. Do do the local people take their own vacation somewhere else in the area? It's a sort of vacation, I guess. But no one's gone away. And then I saw them. People in twos and threes coming from a large building set high at the end of the street. They were all walking together, talking together, laughing and waving back and forth. (laughs) Callista? They're all women. Oh, my God, they're all pregnant. (sighs) I I knew fishermen were only home in the off-season, but this is amazing. Come on, Alfred. Calista, did I imagine that? Isn't it wonderful? And next year, it will be my turn. Next year, she said, it will be my turn. Well, what turn? A turn at being popular? A turn at having babies? Callista was a talkative girl, yet she told me nothing. And far, far more interesting was the old man who came to stay at the Wicklow house on my seventh day in the town. His name was Mortimer. First name or surname, I never knew. But but he was a professor with Dalhousie, and he specialized in maritime biology. It's a, a good place to study ocean life here. No, there's no place better. And you, a writer, couldn't have picked a better spot. Are you uh, interested in the sea? Well, I haven't been before, but now, yes. Ah. And, uh, well, when I drove from Halifax, I saw sharks. They were very close to the shore. Oh. It was was a bit frightening. But I guess that's part of the ocean's attraction, beauty, and fear. You're you're very lucky. There are not many people who see the sharks. 
Oh, porpoises come in by the dozens. But the sharks, huh? Yeah, seeing them so close is a rarity. The ones that appear in this part of the world are usually mutations. Mutations? You mean like crossbreeding? They're not true sharks? Oh, there is no true shark, as you call it. You see, along the coast of every maritime state and province, there live a breed of aquatic creature called Selachians. Now, some are recognizable to the layman, some are recognizable only to the scientist, and some are primordial lynx. They have no name. Next year, it will be my turn. Lots of swimming things out here. Well, we never hear much about there being uh, sharks and strange fish in this part of the world. We, I mean, I mean me and people in the city. There's no need to apologize. I'm, I'm a city man. There are scientists that claim sharks never travel in the depths. Yet a shark has been found recently two and a half miles down in the Atlantic, heavy with young, where the water pressure measures 5,900 pounds per square inch. Mm -hmm. mm. Dogfish, hatched for centuries off the coast of South America, have been found breeding in the chilled waters of Antarctica. <laughs> Strange things happen in the ocean. We'll never know it all. Coffee? Mortimer kept me up to date on the fads and phobias of underwater life. Then Callista laughed enigmatically and added nothing to my store of knowledge except the speculation that she just might be as cross-bred as Professor Mortimer's Salakians. She was just a little vague and out of touch. Days passed, nights passed, and I slept well because of the fresh air. Then I slept lightly because of the voices. Then I didn't sleep. You don't look well, my dear one. Will you be packing up and I'll call that taxi man to take you back to the city? A few nightclubs will brighten you up again. No, that, that's the very thing I'm trying to avoid. I, and I never thought I'd hear a born and bred maritime recommending the bright lights. I would have thought you'd be pushing me down to the harbor to breathe the cold sea air. The low, cloud-colored sky drizzled steadily on those gray rocks. And I didn't like the town. Yet, I couldn't leave. Daddy? Veda? It's okay, darling. Squeeze my hand if you can hear me, can you? All right, love. You know, one thing I really regret is that I never made you a grandfather. Now, I know, I know it was important to you, and I know you should have been able to see the child your daughter would produce for you. And I would have picked a healthy man, I would. Are you laughing? Daddy, squeeze my hand if you're laughing. Really, I'm okay. I just... I had a nightmare and I'm all right now. But would, you, please, would you just leave me alone? Sorry, I just... I just... I just wish that I could look out the window and see something else besides those damn bloody rocks. Now, why would you say that? And they're so beautiful. <laughs> It was less than three days before I planned to leave when things started to happen. Suddenly, going towards the harbor on my ritual walk, doors were opened, things were sold, nets were mended, and fresh lobster floundered in a tub. The fishermen were unusually animated and talked amongst themselves. A and there was a man that looked like Mortimer touching up the paint on the run runner. He was up on the prow of the ship, painting great black eyes and jagged teeth. Right. I really thought he was mad. I mean, painting eyes and a mouth on that poor old boat. Oh, nothing wrong with that, dear. He's well accepted around here now. Professor Mortimer is one of us. And he only needs to help. Have a bit more? Oh, thank you, I will. Uh, it's an old superstition, comfort's end. 
that the boats must be armed against the enemy. Against things in the sea that could overcome us. What she? She served me rainbow trout, nestled in a bed of new PEI potatoes, heavy with salt and butter. And for dessert, I was given a choice of cheese and a tray of home-baked oatmeal cakes. Callista was unusually quiet until... It's that on it. Don't go out. It's first night. What did you say? Callista, what? She's a foolish girl. 30 on her last birthday and we have to keep her home. Almost fun coming to the hospital tonight, Dad. Some uh, woman in maternity had quadruplet. Oh, well, newspapers are here. People from the television. You know, I, uh, giving birth is big news in a hospital, I guess. How, how are you feeling, darling? Squeeze my hand if you're okay. Squeeze my hand. <laughs> we weren't finished, Dad. We weren't finished. You left me and it wasn't over yet. <laughs> I don't care what you say. I was born here and even I can find the town moody and depressing. You dry your tears. And I'm phoning your taxi driver friend to come out tomorrow and take you back to Halifax. I... Not a word, no. That's what's happening. Now, get into the lounge, and Callista will bring you and the professor a nice cup of coffee. Um, Callista said it was birth night. Oh. Is there such a thing? I mean... Does that mean things in the ocean breed at this time of year, or what? <laughs> well, considering I'm leaving soon, I feel I'm entitled to know what makes this community tick. Yes, um, people around here do believe that things happen at this time. You know, old wives' tales and superstition, call it what you like. Here, now, for example, people like to think of the sharks as... Leaders of the local lifestyle, the symbols of the community, you might say. <laughs> Good luck charms for childbearing. You know, the breeding habits of the male shark set it apart from the rest of the underwater world. If you ever saw one up close, you'd see that it had two claspers protruding from its side when the pelvic fins are stretched at right angles to the torso. Now, these claspers are thrust into the female's body and the seminal fluid is injected under the skin. A mating shark appears to be embracing the female. And, of course, it's quite capable of mating in this way with another species. Oh, sounds disgusting. Mm -hmm. do, you, do you mean the male shark actually can, well, hook itself to another species for purpose of mating? I mean, is that what you're saying? What? <laughs> That's what you're saying, my dear. You know what imaginations you young writers have. <laughs> Why, if I read you a few more chapters out of my biology text and left you listening to the ocean's roll in the poor old foghorn, <laughs> I bet you'd have a saleable horror story underway before dawn. <laughs> the colorful imagination's your stock in trade, not mine. <laughs> One spoon of sugar or two? So I listened to the old man until nightfall. And then I went up to my pretty room and cried. I liked that coral gabled rooming house, and I liked my view, dismal rocks and all. And what it came down to was I didn't want to leave at all. I'd like to say I slept there, but the chanting kept me awake. And the waves on the rocks became louder and louder until I knew that the shadows were more than moonlight. They were swimming things. They were creeping up out of the water, sitting on the rocks, touching them, tripping and sliding, streaking back along those seaweed slime paths, watching for seagulls, and finally disappearing through that black glass surface of salt water bubbles. Sorry, 
Come on, dear. Scotch kippers and poached eggs. You won't get it this good in Halifax, despite what the tourist bureau said. <laughs> well, I've got to thank you, Nan. You've been very kind and patient. I realize I wasn't the best of house guests. Rubbish! But just spell my name right when you put all your feelings into a short story or a play. <laughs> well, I'm going down to the harbor, if you'll excuse me. I just want to say goodbye to everything. Will you tell the driver to wait? I won't be long. But he'll be here in a minute. Don't go. Wait here, dear. Don't go. I wandered as far as that large building at the top of the street, the one which disgorged all the happy pregnant girls when I first arrived. It was a sort of church, it seemed, a kind of uh, community hall, a vast auditorium. I went inside. There were bright green walls with black trim, scrolls everywhere on uh, snail patterns. The windows were painted out, and, and the air, it, it was green and filtered like water under the sea, green and mottled. It, it, was, it was decayed light, and, and little little twinkling candles in, in fragile blown glass lanterns and, and high back chairs, and a, and a sort... a sort of altar. Oh! I didn't mean to frighten you, my dear. But now you're here... A little history of the place is called for. You see, to the primitive man, the shark is a vengeful god and cunning. He cannot be satiated by the occasional gift of a man. He demands extraordinary homage. Sometimes natural rocks are used for stone altars and are the sites of mystic ceremonies. Who are we to question our ancestors? Who are we to deny our inheritance? No, no, Professor Mortimer, this is 1981. We are not in Samoa. I mean, we're, we're not in ancient Tahiti. This is Nova Scotia. The people here, they're, they're fishermen. They're, they're, yes, yes, they're childlike in their superstitions, but they are not violent. They're, they're not frightening. They're, they're not pagan. Don't be afraid, my dear. If you don't believe, you can leave. Remember, you have always had the right to leave. They're all down by the rocks now. They're down by the rocks now, she said. And they were. It was a clear day. Seagulls swooped down, antagonizing the curlews. And bright black patent leather fins cut lines in the water, its silver streaks among the dank gray rocks. And all those fine young women, thin now and red-cheeked, they were lined up against the tide with their blanketed bundles in their arms. The season be with us and praising for our own. The season be with us and praising for my time shall come. The season be with us and praise him for he is the father. I watched. Fascinated. And terrified. And, and a man suddenly stepped forward. It was Mortimer. It, he wore a white lace cassock. It, it was gleaming like his hair and, and lined with rows of green and blue stitching, deep sea colors. And his hands were pale. In the name of the Father. In the name of his Son. Blessed be the children. Suffer all little ones. For they shall come. For they shall come. For they shall come. In the name of the Father. In the name of the Father. Deadly, with no pads. Jagged edges for cutting feet and straight, slime colored slides ending in bottomless pools to fall in. You, you see, when the wind came up, without warning, catching the pink and blue blankets of those young women, whipping them all like the eye of a storm, battering Mortimer in a sea green cassock, I shielded my eyes. And then I ran away. And, and 
the tide was full of swimming things. There were bottomless pits of bubbles. I cut my feet. My stockings were blood-soaked. My hands were raw. And things in those rocks, they snatched out at me. They, they embraced me. They clung to my hair. They slipped across my lips and slid along my legs. I, I, I made it as far as the highway. A truck um, aimed for the city took pity on me, and he picked me up. And... I never went back for my bag. Here. Do we feel like visitors? There's a Mrs. Whitlow outside to see us. She seems like a nice lady. Uh, wh why do hospitals always operate on the royal we? I mean, Mrs. Whitlow isn't here to see us. She's here to see me. Sorry, yes, I'll see her. And there are you, looking as pretty as ever. I knew the mood of our part of the country was hard to take. I told you. Mrs. Whitlow... Did I really see it, or did I imagine it? You didn't imagine anything, dear. You just had a nasty fall against the rocks. And that's the way it's been. Oh, whenever I tell anyone about that christening Sunday, when the wind gathered in a little fishing community of Comfort's End, and pulled out hair, and hurt our eyes, and forced the folds of those soft blue and pink christening blankets back for an instant in the arms of those bright-eyed young women. And whenever I try to explain about those bulging baby eyes and those fragile membrane fins pressed against those pale baby cheeks, they say I'm crazy. And they turn away. Easy, dear. Take it easy. Remember, next summer, it could be your turn. You have just heard In the Name of the Father by Janet Benelli. Featured tonight were Dixie Seatel as Ada, with Chris Wiggins as Professor Mortimer, and Ruth Springford as Nan Wicklow. You heard Nikki Guadani as Kalista. Hugh Webster as the cab driver, and Eve Crawford as Kate. The recording engineer was Ray Falsick, with sound effects by Matt Wilcott, and the production assistance of Nancy McElveen. In the Name of the Father was produced and directed for the series by Stephen Katz. The coordinating producer for Nightfall is Bill Howell. And now, here is a final word from your host. Hello again. Next week on Nightfall, we'll have something extra cuddly for you to play with. Of course, we can't promise you'll get much sleep. Mine. Mine. She's mine. None of your affair, do you hear me? You touch, baby doll, and you'll burn. You hear me? Burn. Alice? Bonnie? Where are you going? Out. Loomis was right, Kathleen. Who? Loomis? We don't know anybody by that name, do we? Baby Doll. By Larry LeClaire. Starring Jay Bowen and Elba May Hoover. And featuring the return to radio drama of director Fred D.L. That's next week on Nightfall. Until then. Careful. Of the edge. <laughs> 